dark energy, dark matter. Mm -hmm. How do they differ? Well, unfortunately, they have similar sounding names. And since we don't really don't know what either of them is, they sh I don't think we should have named them. That We should have given them fake names until we understood them. I, 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 I've been voting for, like, Fred and Wilma. <laughs> <laughs> Something that doesn't give you any cosmic uh, bias. All right? So I can tell you simply what dark matter is. But don't think of it as matter. I, I don't want to. I'm a. I'm, not, I'm it's not like this table. I don't. I, we don't know what it is, so I don't even want to use those two words. If if anything, it's dark gravity, because we look in the universe and we see the effects of gravity, and we say, let's add up all the stars and galaxies and and planets and comets and black holes, everything we know about, to account for this gravity that we see. We account for one sixth of the forces of gravity we see in the universe. Mm. There is no known objects accounting for most of the effect of gravity in the universe. Something is making stuff move that is not anything we have ever touched. And that's something you call, for lack of a better term, dark matter. But that even implies it's matter. What it truly is is dark gravity. Mm. Boom. That's a problem that's been around since the 1930s. It's the longest standing unsolved problem in astrophysics. So now, dark energy. We look out in the universe and we expect to see the universe, we're in a, in a, our universe is expanding. We've known this since Hubble, the man, yeah. Hubble. There was a man called Hubble before he, beca before he became a telescope yeah. uh, back in the <laughs> 1920s. And uh, Edwin Hubble, he discovered not only that our galaxy is one of many, he discovered that galaxies are scattering apart from one another. This was the expanding universe in 1929. So... When you reveal this, you say, okay, if we've been doing this for a while, all those gravities, all those galaxies are going to feel each other, and they're going to ultimately want to slow us down in this expansion. So you go out to measure that. And that act led to a measurement that no one believed. That, initially, that the universe is accelerating. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up. These measurements were made back in the 1980s, uh, back in the 1990s, a Nobel Prize has now been awarded for this discovery, just recently, a couple of years ago. The discovery papers were in 1998. So we don't know what's going on. Some mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space acting opposite the force of gravity. We don't know what it is, but we can measure its effect. So you measure it by measuring the, its impact on something else. Precisely. It's, so it's an impact on the 4% that we can measure. So it's the pressure that's expanding the universe? Something. I use the word pressure. I, I, something is, make, is making the universe accelerate again. We know why we got, so we had a Big Bang. Big Bang put everything into motion. I, I'm good with that. We're good. It's like me tossing a ball up into the air. It's moving upward even though it's slowing down. Okay? Gravity is slowing down that upward motion. We expected gravity to be slowing down the expanding universe. The opposite is happening. We don't know what's causing it. He says, what, quote, I think the major branches of discovery are behind us. Do you agree? Of course not. Oh my gosh. That is, uh, we're put, I would say this to the man's face, that you can't be more, uh, that's, let me be polite. Um, previous statements such as that made by physicists of the past, um, have proven to be extremely short-sighted. How's that for polite? <laughs> that, that'll do. That'll okay, do. so uh, there was a physicist, one of these uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist at the, in the 1800s going into the 1900s, the turn of that century. We were at the top of classical physics. Newton's laws were working, electricity was understood. This, we had the power of of knowledge of the laws of nature. And they said, but there are a couple of things, there's still some unknowns, but that's just a matter of getting an extra decimal place in the measurement. But new eyed, we're done. We're done here. Just a few clouds on the horizon. We're good to go. Don't, be, don't become a physicist. There's nothing left to discover. Right. And what would happen in the next 20 years? Relativity would be discovered, special relativity and general relativity, the expanding universe, quantum physics, all of classical physics would be turned on its ear because of the discoveries in the very two or three decades to follow the uttering of that statement. So 
Of course he can't see the future. That's kind of what it means to not be in the future. Uh, half of my library are old books because I like seeing how people thought about their world at their time so that I don't get big-headed about something we just discovered and I can be humble about where we might go next because you can see who got stuff right and most of the people who got stuff wrong. Oh, uh, I hate to sound cliche about this, but my favorite questions are the ones dare I use the word, yet to be divined, because there's a discovery yet to take place that will bring that question into the center of the table. I live for those questions. So that means I can't tell you what they are, because they derive from something yet to be discovered. From dark matter. Influencing. For example, if we discover what dark matter is, there's going to be some question about dark matter that'll rise up out of the out of the, the ground and say, I never even thought to ask that question. In 1920, no one thought to ask, how fast is the universe accelerating? Okay, how fast is the universe expanding? Because no one thought the universe was expanding at all. You can't ask questions about the movement of a universe that you don't even know is in motion. You can't ask questions about other galaxies if you don't even know there are other galaxies. So, on my deathbed, I will relish in all of the questions that came up that I, never, that I never thought to ask because it was the discoveries of the future that enabled them. Yeah, and so therein is the value to us, not only of the methods and tools of science, but also of the language of the universe that we call mathematics. Remarkable thing, a point first advanced by Eugene Brigner that Math has an unreasonable utility in the universe since we just invented it out of our heads. You don't discover math under a rock, as you might find a grubs. You, you invent it out of whole cloth. Yet, it empowers us to provide accurate and predictive descriptions and understandings of the universe. And so what comes of this is you learn to abandon your senses. Uh, you, you, you are train yourself to abandon your senses because you recognize how they can fool you into thinking one thing is true that is not. You abandon them, you use your tools that do the measuring to say, okay, that's the reality. Then you make a mathematical model of that that you can manipulate logically, because math is all about the logical extension of one point to another, and then you can make new discoveries about the world that, frankly, you'll just have to get used to. You, no longer do you have the right, right is not the right word, but no, no longer do you have the, no, no longer are you justified saying that idea in science is not true because it doesn't make sense. Absolutely. So nobody cares about your senses. Yes. Your senses came out, forget the Serengeti, just growing up. As a kid, you, something's in your hand, you let go of it, it falls. You tip a glass, water spills. You are assembling a rule book for how nature works in the macroscopic world. The microscope takes you smaller than that, the telescope takes you bigger, and other laws of physics manifest themselves in those regimes that you have no life experience reckoning. And so, so it's math that allows you to take these incremental steps beyond the capacity of your senses and perhaps even the capacity of your mind. Yes, it's the mind that's taking the steps, but your mind was not deducing that by just looking at the world with your senses. It was helped out. It was aided by these tools that, yes, that we invented. In the 1920s, which was a watershed decade in the history of science, in that decade, we discovered that not only our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not the only existence of anything in the universe, that there are other Milky Ways out there. That recently? 1920s. Did, was it just the op optics didn't exist for that? We needed a big enough telescope, and Edward Hubble wielded all the glass that necessary to accomplish that back in the 1920s. He said, Hubble, before the telescope, was a man, and, <laughs> and had his own telescope, the biggest of its day, and he made that discovery. 
that there were these spiral fuzzy things in the night sky. We thought they were just local to us. They're whole other systems of stars, 100 billion stars unto itself, outside of our system. Not only was that discovered in 1926, 1929 he discovers that the universe is expanding, which means it may have had a big, back then, it may have had a beginning. If it's expanding, that meant it was littler in the past. Well, there must have been a day when it was all together in the same place. Thus was born the Big Bang. Okay, so now, also in that decade, quantum, quantum mechanics, quantum physics was discovered. That is the science of the small, the science of electrons, protons, neutrons, particles, nuclei. At the time, you'd say, this is just the, this is just physicists burning tax money. Because who cares about the atom? I got my horse to feed. I got kids. I got, you know, you got issues in society. Yet it's quantum mechanics that is the entire foundation of our technological revolution. There would be no computers. There would be no, there would be none of what you take for granted. Your iPod, your iPhone, cell phones, the space program, without our understanding of the laws of physics as they operate on that atomic and molecular and nuclear level. And so, the, the, the chemist has no understanding of the periodic table of elements without quantum mechanics. To them, it's just a list of elements. Quantum mechanics tells you why this column is there, and that's there, why this mates with that, and why that makes a molecule with that. That's quantum mechanics, and it's unheralded. You ask me if there's any discovery that has changed how we live, it is quantum mechanics. And I make, I make this point because I'm ready to... Today, you hear people saying, why are we spending money up there when we've we got problems on Earth? And, we, and people don't connect the time delay between the frontier of scientific research and how that's going to transform your life later down the line. The, the, all they want is a quarterly report that shows the product that comes out of it. That is so short-sighted that that's the beginning of the end of your culture. So it's... There was a suggestion that there was a companion star to the sun, provi provisionally called Nemesis, that would have this long orbit that would jostle comets in the outer solar system and send them raining down on Earth, creating mass extinctions, accounting for the extinction episodes in the fossil record. But the, it was an interesting hypothesis that was never supported by data, and so when you're not supported by data, you discard the hypothesis. That's how science works. You don't believe something just because you want to, or think something's true just because it feels good. At some point, you've got to confront the data. The greatest need is to be able to have the foresight necessary to make investments on the frontier of science, even if at the time you make those investments, you cannot figure out how that might make you rich tomorrow. Michael Faraday, in the 1840s, was the first one to pass a wire through a magnetic field. And it made a little meter tick on a, on a it moved a, 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 a meter. He hooked up to it. Now this guy, you do this and this happens. That's kind of cool. If you're nerdy, it's a, it's a, to a nerd, that's a cool thing, right? You do this and this happens. <laughs> and so what was happening is, it induced a current through the wire. He showed his colleagues. It looked like just kind of a curiosity, a toy. Showed it to Parliament. They say, why, is this what we're funding? We're funding this toy? And this may be apocryphal, but it is said of Faraday, in response to this inquiry, said, because they asked, well, what value is this to the British Empire and to the king? He said, I don't know what value it is today, but I know one day you're going to tax it. <laughs> And in fact, that is the foundation of how all electricity is made today. <laughs> and it would take another 60 years before electricity would come to homes. But who could have known it at the time? Friends in the hood make fun of you? A little bit. A little bit. That, because the hood that I was in was not sort of the stereotyped hood that people imagined. Uh, my earliest memories are the East Bronx and the housing projects there, the Castle Hill middle income housing projects. But then my father's income went above that level. And they, they, they kick you out when that happens. And so we moved. And we moved to Riverdale. Oh. Uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Riverdale. That's uptown Bronx. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's uptown. <laughs> so in the Bronx, there wasn't so much of the force of the hood that you might think. But nonetheless, there were pres pressures for me to be athletic. for, yeah. And no one really cared about what I was doing. But I cared about what I was doing.